so um, to get started, uh, as a means of introduction, I uh, am pretty interested in applications in, ro in robotics and how we might allow robots to develop intelligent behavior through learning, interaction, and so forth. Um, however, this talk will actually be primarily focused on machine learning, but we'll actually see some robots come in uh, in a few points in the talk. So uh, the really core mo motivation behind this talk is that we've seen that machine learning can work quite well for a variety of problems, ranging from image classification to natural language problems. However, uh, it works really well on the training data distribution. And these methods have this core assumption that our training distribution is going to match our test distribution, which is broken regularly in practice. And I think that especially now that we've seen machine learning methods really, really thrive on, on large and diverse data sets with actually fairly broad data distributions, one of the next frontiers of machine learning will be thinking very critically about settings when the distribution changes at test time. Now, why does this actually matter? Uh, to motivate uh, distribution shift, I wanna give a few examples of where distribution shift arises in practice. So uh, one example actually in a robotic setting is when we wanna do reinforcement learning from an offline data set rather than from only online interaction. In this setting, you have a distribution shift between the policy represented in the data set and the policy being optimized. And if you don't actually account for this distribution shift and the fact that you may start seeing out of distribution states, then if you try to train a robot to close the door, uh, close the drawer, you get a policy that looks like this, where it uh, kind of just waves its arm in the, in the air in a closing motion, but nowhere near the drawer, and ends up uh, somewhat dangerously crashing its uh, gripper into the table. And so this is a setting where if we don't account for distribution shift, uh, robots are not at all functional when you want them to learn from static data sets. Um, and the, this policy has a 0% success rate. Um, another example where distribution shift comes up all the time is when we want to train a model on the past and deploy a model in the future, which is most applications of machine learning. Uh, so an example of this, uh, in 2009, some folks at Google published a paper on detecting influenza epidemics using search engine queries. And they found that their model had a 0.97 mean correlation with CDC data, which is awesome. Uh, but then by February 2013, this model was predicting double the incidence of the flu compared to the CDC data and was started to perform quite poorly once it kind of moved forward in time. Uh, further, as another example, a recent paper by Anjaliki showed that uh, if you uh, train language models and test them over different periods of time, the language models get progressively worse as time goes on on the x-axis. Cool, so those are two examples of distribution shift. Um, one more example of distribution shift arises from different domains or subpopulations of a data. So for example, if you wanted to uh, predict whether a comment online is toxic or not toxic to try to make the internet a better place, uh, it turns out that a model like this can get 92% average test accuracy. However, if you train it, or if you evaluate it on different subpopulations, the accuracy drops significantly to around 69% on non-toxic comments mentioning a black demographic. This means that if the distribution shifted towards a population that had a larger proportion of, uh, of uh, black people or people talking about um, topics related to that demographic, we would see a substantial drop in performance. Um, another example uh, is predicting the properties of different molecules which could be very useful for drug discovery applications. Um, in this study, you can get a 34.4% average precision on test molecules from training scaffolds. However, if you then want to deploy this model to molecules with new scaffolds that aren't seen in the training data set, the average precision, precision drops significantly. And these, this is even after training on thousands of different mole, molecules from thousands of different scaffolds. Cool, so if you're interested um, in this, this latter type of distribution shift, uh, I'd encourage you to take a look at the WILDS benchmark. It has these two problems, and it also has five more data sets with these kinds of distribution shift, ranging from ecological conservation to medical imaging. Uh, and 
It has uh, significant drops caused by distribution shift and very real world applications. And it also has data sets that have some amount of leverage that should be helpful for actually tackling this form of distribution shift. Uh, and, and the WILDS benchmark was an effort led by Pangwei and Chiori, and they really did a fa fantastic job with the benchmark. And they're also eager for feedback from the community. OK, so hopefully I've now convinced you that distribution shift really matters, and it's something that we should care about. How do we actually go about addressing distribution shift? Um, so today I'd like to talk about three different tools for addressing this problem. The first will be uh, pessimism. The second will be adaptation. And the third will be anticipation. And as we go along, we're going to be introducing more assumptions about how the distribution is changing and the problem setting that we're in, but also um, kind of seeing more powerful performance as a result. OK, so let's first talk about pessimism. So uh, the principle of pessimism is essentially that we're going to assume that there is kind of some class of distributions that we might shift towards, and we want to prepare for the worst case. And there's this really beautiful framework called distributionally robust optimization that does exactly this, where we assume some uncertainty set over distributions, Q, um, or sorry, U of P, and then we consider, we optimize for the worst case distribution Q within this uncertainty set. Um, and then of course, uh, the choice of uncertainty set becomes a really important one in this framework. Um, you can see adversarial training is a special case of this, um, although oftentimes adversarial training doesn't prepare the model for more natural shifts in the distribution. Um, and some other common choices for this uncertainty set include constraining the distribution to be within some Wasserstein distance of the empirical distribution P, um, approaches based on conditional value at risk that consider all distributions over some portion of the data set. Uh, and lastly, what I'll call group DRO, which uh, considers breaking up your data set into different domains and considering the distributions over different proportions of that domain. Uh, and then if you optimize this objective, then what you end up getting for your uncertainty set is the different distributions that place mass only over each of those domains, because that will be the kind of worst case situation um, in that set. OK, um, so uh, this is a really nice framework for thinking about distribution shift, uh, although it has a number of challenges. So for Wasserstein DRO and CVAR DRO, um, both of which I'll refer to broadly as joint DRO, uh, it has a very large uncertainty set. There's a very large number of distributions. And as a result, you can often be a bit too pessimistic about the kind of distribution that you may see at test time. And you may sacrifice performance as a result of being too pessimistic. Uh, and then with regard to group DRO, um, these methods tend to be less pessimistic, but they also require detailed knowledge during training about um, the kinds of shift that you'll see and what domains exist in your training data. Um, so ultimately, what we'd like is a method that can kind of overcome these challenges without requiring detailed knowledge during training um, and also without being too pessimistic. So to dive a little bit deeper into a concrete problem setting, we want to consider the problem setting of where a setting where there's spurious correlations in a significant portion of your training data set. And we want to understand if uh, joint DRO methods like CVAR DRO and uh, if group DRO can produce models that are robust to these spurious correlations. Um, and so as, um, as, a, as a concrete case study, we'll look at four different uh, data sets. One of them is the online content moderation task that I mentioned before. Uh, and the others include settings where you have correlation between a bird and the background of the image, correlations between hair color and gender, and spurious correlations between uh, entailment versus contradiction, and whether there's a negation in the text. Uh, and what we find is uh, if we train models with ERM or models with joint DRO and group DRO, uh, first we find that there is a drop between average accuracy and worst group accuracy, which is measuring the performance um, on the, the, the group of the data set where, um, where the spurious correlation either holds or doesn't hold. Uh, and we find that 
group DRO does well, it's able to significantly improve upon the worst group accuracy compared to ERM and DRO. But of course, this requires labels. Um, it requires you to know what the spurious correlation is, and it requires all of the examples in your training data set to be labeled with that spurious correlation. Uh, and then further, uh, we find that CVAR DRO or, or joint DRO, uh, it doesn't require this assumption, but unfortunately it shows very little gains over empirical risk minimization. Okay, so how do we start bridging this gap? Um, just to understand this, we first wanted to understand whether, like, why joint DRO doesn't work well for this kind of problem. Uh, and because the, because we see that gr group DRO does well and joint DRO uh, doesn't do well, one thing we might hypothesize is that perhaps joint DRO is less directed at the minority groups, at the groups for which the spurious correlation doesn't hold, compared to group DRO. And if we actually plot which points uh, joint DRO is prioritizing over the course of training. And we specifically look at the number of minority examples that are being prioritized by joint DRO over the course of training. We see that at the beginning, it does actually prioritize a lot of these minority points, but then over the course of training, it starts actually prioritizing them less and prioritizing other data points. So this seems to suggest that uh, joint DRO isn't sufficiently prioritizing examples where the spurious correlations don't hold. And perhaps if we were able to better prioritize these examples, then we may be able to build a more robust model. And so the key idea behind uh, what we wanted to do to tackle this problem is first try to automatically identify the points where spurious correlations don't hold, and then prioritize these examples when training, for example, by upsampling them or by upweighting them. Okay, so then the key question is how do we go about approaching stage one? And the insight that we can take here is that we can remember that ERM models perform poorly on examples where the spurious correlations don't hold because they pick up on those spurious features. And with this insight, this means that we can actually develop an approach that essentially trains an ERM model and then finds the examples for which the ERM model does poorly and upsamples exactly those examples. And so that's exactly what we'll do. We'll first train uh, what we'll call an identification model with empirical risk minimization. Then we'll compute the, mis the examples for which this model misclassifies. We'll call this the error set for which the predicted label is not equal to the true label. And then we'll upsample the examples from this error set in the training set and train a new model on this modified data set that upsamples these misclassified examples. Uh, and note here that the misclassified examples are going to be fixed during the course of training. So unlike DRO, it's unlike joint DRO, like I showed on the previous slide, it should persistently prioritize these examples. Okay, so we'll refer to this as just train twice or JTT. Uh, and experimentally, we'll compare this approach to uh, DRO methods, to ERM, and also to a method called learning from failure. That's a paper from NeurIPS a few months ago uh, that is kind of an approach that's representative of the state of the art here and has strong results. Uh, and uh, importantly, all of the methods are going to be tuned with respect to the worst group validation loss. Uh, this is actually a point that a lot of papers end up sweeping under the rug. Uh, it does mean that you actually have to have information about the spurious attribute in the validation set, unfortunately, uh, but this is hopefully an assumption that we can get rid of in, uh, in the near term. Okay, and then in terms of the results, uh, we first see that uh, this approach of just trained twice achieves a 10% improvement in worst group accuracy on three out of the four data sets compared to the kind of the best approach among these prior three. And on the fourth data set, it also shows uh, a 2% improvement, uh, although it's, so it's still improving, it's just not quite as substantial. And then we also see that on two out of the four data sets, uh, JTT is actually comparable to group DRO uh, without requiring any labels about the groups during training. Uh, so this is quite nice. 
Okay, so digging into the performance a little bit more, uh, what data points does JTT identify when it's actually in the first stage and what data points is it upweighting in the second stage? So first we wanted to look at what portion of the error set corresponds to these minority examples where the spurious correlation doesn't hold. Uh, and what we see is this is showing the number, the percentage of the error set that corresponds to minority groups and also the percentage of the empirical distribution that has these minority group data points. And so overall, we have a much higher rate of minority points in the error set versus in the empirical distribution, um, specifically for water birds, multi-NLI, and civil comments. Um, slub A is a little bit different because there's actually, um, there's the minority points are actually a little bit more ambiguous and the definition of minority points is actually including a lot more points that may not actually be considered minority from the, from the data set. Okay, and then now what if we take this error set and manipulate it a little bit? What if we essentially take this error set and remo remove some of the majority points or remo remove the minority points from the error set? So if here I, sorry if I interrupt, I guess there are some questions uh, both in chat and I guess in audience. Yeah, so, um, so, the, uh, so the question in chat is that how does the train twice approach compares to curriculum learning strategy that first rank samples by their loss? So I'm not um, familiar with the particular curriculum learning strategy that you're talking about. Um, so maybe you can elaborate on that. Yeah, sorry. So uh, we, we can do this uh, at the end of the talk. If I don't want to uh, um, disrupt your flow, uh, but uh, basic, uh, like that's the whole field. But uh, the idea, of course, that the objective is not uh, distributional shift uh, or generalization, but uh, rather uh, to improve better models and uh, to, to get better models in terms of accuracy, like even ERM. By uh, by defining like uh, what what are uh, what are the example the samples that the models perform rather poorly on, and 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 in what stage of the training you should feed those examples into into your model, and into your training loop. So yeah. uh, in order to learn that that curriculum, and one of those strategies is that you uh, train once and see uh, like their their loss, and uh, rank them based on their loss and uh, basically use that ranking in order to give a curriculum. Uh, so this train twice uh, seems a, a bit similar to that uh, basic idea that you uh, look at the test at the training loss. So for that, you need to train at least once. So any comment on that? Yeah, maybe I'll at the same time also comment on the relation to boosting, which is somewhat similar to the strategy that you mentioned before, where you kind of iteratively try to pick the examples where um, the model is, is doing more poorly on. So um, I guess one thing that I'll mention is that we actually found it pretty important to only do this twice. And if you do it iteratively, then uh, it actually isn't able to be as robust. Um, it, it doesn't kind of show the same sorts of properties of robustness. Uh, and this suggests that perhaps the mechanism underlying uh, kind of why this is producing robustness is probably a bit different from approaches that consider an, a much more iterative approach um, because specifically trying to target uh, examples where spurious correlations are holding. Um, yeah, I think that's per perhaps maybe my main response and I could also think about it a bit more and, and we can discuss it after the talk. Shine. Thank you. Hey, um, yeah, I, I, I wonder about the table that you have with results. To what extent is it specific to the particular task? I mean, you are offering it, you're showing results, and I wonder how, to what extent they are particular to the application you applied it to, and to what how do they generalize to other tasks? Because you do want the JTT to generalize to other tasks. Yeah, so um, these were the first four data sets that we tried. Uh, and 
So from that sense, I think that's actually uh, a, a positive indication that it seems like this, uh, we didn't like, like really try hard, like try to get this to work for other approaches to other data sets, for example. We, we did look a little bit at the breeds benchmark, which has a version of subpopulation shift. And we, um, in our kind of initial attempts at that data set, uh, we didn't see significant improvements uh, from, from this kind of approach, but we also didn't try that hard to, to tune it um, and to understand what was going on. Uh, so I would say that at least it, it seems to be quite effective for addressing issues with spurious correlations, uh, but for distribution shift more broadly, I think it's, um, it's not clear if this method would work well or not. Thank you. Okay, cool. So getting back to understanding the data points and the, and the sets of data points that this identifies, we want to look at what if we remove, we, what if we kind of manipulate the error set to remove all of the majority points or all of the minority points. And specifically we plotted the performance with the original error set versus with the, these two modified error sets. And surprisingly, we found that performance dropped both when we removed minority points and when we removed majority points. Um, and this was surprising because we thought that perhaps only the minority points would be, would be helpful because those are the ones where we know that the spurious correlation doesn't hold. Um, however, what we can do is we actually started to visualize the majority points that it's upweighting. Um, so for example, with the water birds data set, one of the majority groups is when you have a water bird on a water background. And if we look at the points that are in the error set versus not in the error set, what we see is the, the kind of water backgrounds that we see in the error set are somewhat ambiguously a water background, whereas they are much less ambiguously a water background for the data points that are not in the error set. And so what this suggests is that the, uh, this approach is not only picking up on, on settings where the spurious correlation doesn't hold at all, but also on settings where the spurious attribute is difficult to detect from the input. Cool. Um, so the takeaway here is that uh, with this sort of approach, we can achieve robustness to spurious correlations by prioritizing these uh, more difficult data points. Cool, and then one quick aside I wanna make before wrapping up the pessimism part is, what about pessimism for reinforcement learning? Uh, and I specifically wanna go back to the, the reinforcement learning problem that I mentioned before, where you have distribution shift between the policy and the data set and the policy being optimized. Uh, and it turns out that, I, that the kind of principle of pessimism is actually really useful for this kind of setting where you simply try to be pessimistic about the value of out of distribution states and out of distribution actions. And this essentially allows you to optimize for a policy that tries to avoid visiting those out of distribution states such that you don't make uh, bad decisions in those states because they're out of distribution. Uh, and in this sense, actually reinforcement learning can be somewhat easier than supervised learning because you have the ability to potentially avoid out of distribution parts of the space. Uh, and there's actually a, a number of prior works, a very recent prior papers that all have this underlying principle of pessimism where you're trying to either minimize key values for out of distribution states and actions or add a reward penalty on these, on these states. Uh, and these approaches are, are representative of some of the state of the art approaches and all of them also come with uh, theoretical performance guarantees, which is also quite nice. And lastly, if you apply um, this idea of pessimism to offline RL on a real robot, uh, you can get it to successfully close the drawer, um, despite the fact that it was only trained on a static data set um, with a different policy. Um, and this policy has a 76% success rate. Okay, so um, in summary, uh, pessimism seems to be a powerful tool for addressing spurious correlations and policy distribution shift. It makes very it makes fewer assumptions about the kind of distribution shift that you're going to be seeing and what things you have access to. And it's also often possible to analyze theoretically, like in the reinforcement learning examples that I mentioned, and also in tools like DRO. Okay, so now let's talk a bit about adaptation. Uh, and to motivate why we should adapt, I want to introduce a very simple example. Uh, so say that you want to learn a binary classifier between data points that are plus signs versus data points that are circles. 
if some of your data looks something like this, uh, and maybe some of your data looks shifted uh, like this, then even for this very simple form of distribution shift, approaches that try to be robust to that distribution shift won't be able to solve this problem. Uh, and the reason is that if you kind of view these data points uh, on the same axes, then you see that they're not separable. Uh, and maybe this is something that we should maybe be concerned about because it seems like this is a very simple form of distribution shift where things have just shifted in the input space a little bit. Uh, and uh, with this in mind, one thing that we can think about is instead of trying to learn a single model that is robust to any form of distribution shift, maybe for these kinds of problems, we should instead try to develop approaches that can adapt to distribution shift. Okay, um, and so if we see enough of these different kinds of groups of data during training and see a little bit of unlabeled data at test time, like these data points here, then this problem should actually be solvable. We should be able to figure out the decision boundary here. Okay, um, and so there's a number of potential solutions for this problem ranging from domain adaptation to transfer learning to meta-learning. Um, and to kind of try to zone in on a specific use case, uh, we want to consider the motivating problem setting of federated learning. Uh, and so, for example, say we wanted to build a federated hand handwriting recognition system that can recognize the handwriting of different users uh, or uh, different devices. Uh, and in this sort of setting, one notable characteristic is that there are potentially many different target domains rather than just one target domain. Um, and because of this, we probably want to be able to adapt on the fly to a new target domain rather than training and targeting one particular target domain. And we also want to be able to adapt with minimal data, with minimal labels and minimal compute, of course, especially if we want to actually deploy this onto a user's device, for example. Okay, so with this example in mind, um, we're going to try to develop an approach that can adapt to different forms of distribution shift with only unlabeled data. So we're gonna assume that we have uh, a number of unlabeled data points from a new test domain, which could be a new user, a different time of day, or a new place. And given these test examples, we want to then adapt our model using these unlabeled labeled examples and then in further labels. Uh, so in contrast to the approaches that I was mentioning before, one assumption we're going to make here is that we have access to unlabeled test inputs from one group, either in batch or in a streaming setting. Uh, so this is somewhat similar to a transductive setting. Um, however, we're also assuming that these test examples are from a single domain or a single part of the distribution. Okay, and the way that we're gonna prepare our model for, um, for adapting to different parts of the distribution is to first separate the training data into different domains potentially using metadata about where the data came from, for example, if it came from different users, and then train the model so that it can adapt with unlabeled examples from an individual domain. Cool, so this is the kind of the general framework, and it turns out that we can take meta-learning methods and adapt them uh, in a relatively straightforward way to solve this kind of problem. Um, the main difference from existing meta-learning methods is that we need to be able to adapt with only unlabeled data. Um, so for example, one thing that we could do is we could take the model agnostic meta-learning method and use a learned loss function in order to adapt with these unlabeled examples. So we'll learn both the initial parameters and the loss function such that when we adapt on that loss function with the unlabeled examples, we produce a model that can perform well. Um, separately, we can also use meta-learning methods that use a context variable, um, such as the architecture shown here, where we feed these unlabeled examples into an architecture to produce the context and use these context, use this context to make predictions about the label. Uh, and in the simplest case, this context variable can correspond to batch normalization statistics, where you're simply calculating the batch form statistics over the unlabeled examples from your test domain and using those computed statistics when making predictions. Um, note this is different than standard batch norm because in standard batch norm you often try to make your batches uncorrelated 
where in this case, you're specifically making them correlated in the way that you're going to see correlated batches at test time. Okay, um, so we're gonna compare this kind of adaptive uh, meta-learning style approach with ERM, with DRO style methods, as well as, and this is specifically group DRO, um, as well as an upweighting uh, method that upweights the groups or domains in, in the training distribution to be the uniform distribution. Um, and we'll compare three different flavors of this adaptive approach that use a context variable, that use batch from statistics, or that use a learned loss function. Okay, and on the federated handwriting recognition task that I mentioned before, where we want to adapt to new users with only unlabeled data from that user, we see that we get a 5% improvement in average accuracy, and we see a 10% improvement in the worst case accuracy, uh, where worst case is evaluated over different users. Um, so this is pretty nice, and this is pretty substantial. Uh, and qualitatively, if we look at what it's actually doing, um, if we give an Im this image here, uh, ERM says that this is a two. Uh, if you give these two examples to uh, the adaptive method, that it's also going to classify it as a two because these two examples doesn't, don't give it that much information about the user. However, if you give all 50 of these examples to the adaptive method, it can correctly figure out that this is actually a lowercase a um, because it can look at the other examples and for example, see here that this is how that user writes a two and, um, and this is, uh, and, and therefore it's likely that this is not how they write a two and this is how they write an A instead. Okay, um, and then one last example we looked at was uh, these corrupted image data sets introduced by Hendricks and Diedrich. Uh, and our goal was to adapt to new image corruptions that we hadn't seen during training. And so we trained using 56 corruptions and tested using 22 disjoint corruptions. Uh, and what we found here is on, on CIFAR-10C and tiny ImageNet C, uh, we see a three to 10% improvement in average accuracy and an eight to 21% improvement in worst case accuracy. Or we see the, the larger improvements specifically on, on CIFAR and the smaller improvements on tiny ImageNet. Okay, great. Um, and so the takeaway here is that really a small amount of unlabeled data can provide a lot of leverage for tackling distribution shift. Okay, and then time permitting, I think I have time to cover this, um, is what if you don't have, what if you don't have a way to separate your training data into different domains or into different groups? Or you don't know, um, yeah, how this is separated. And you, but you still want to be able to adapt to different forms of distribution shift. Um, for this, we're actually going to look at a reinforcement learning setting where we have one training environment, and then we want to be able to adapt to new test environments that are kind of out of distribution compared to the training environment. Where, for example, there's an obstacle, there's a force perturbation, or maybe the, the joints have become disabled. So in this case, we just have a single training environment and we don't know, like we don't have any kind of training groups and we can't really train it to adapt to any of those training groups because we just have a single environment. Um, and so the simple idea that we can use here to train for the ability to adapt is to learn multiple solutions to the problem. Um, and then then once we learn those multiple solutions, we can adapt our solution set to the test MDP. Um, and while I'll introduce this in the setting of reinforcement learning, I think that these ideas can actually be translated to the supervised learning setting. Um, so for example, if your goal was to navigate to this, this red ball here, you could learn multiple solutions for getting there. And then at test time, when something has changed, such as there being an obstacle there, then you can kind of pick the solution in your solution set that still succeeds at the problem. Okay, so this is making a couple assumptions. Um, the first assumption of course, is that we have the ability to adapt. We can essentially run a few trajectories out and pick the solution that we find works the best. And the second assumption is with regard to how the environment is changing. And specifically, we're assuming here that the changes to the environment are local uh, in the sense that 
uh, an optimal policy in this test environment also does well in your training environment. Uh, and, and this is important because if this assumption doesn't hold, then these solutions to your training MDP won't be good or valid solutions to the test MDP. Okay. Um, and essentially this gives you a few shot robustness to these sorts of local changes to obstacles and terrains and friction and so forth. Um, how do you go about learning multiple solutions? Uh, you can essentially try to learn a controllable space of diverse policies that achieve uh, a return that's close to optimal. And so to learn a controllable space of diverse policies, we'll try to learn uh, a latent variable policy for which this latent variable controls the solution that you're using. And uh, for this latter part, we can form a constrained optimization such that for each value of this latent variable, the policy achieves a return that's within epsilon of optimal. Um, so we get an objective that looks like this, where we're maximizing um, mutual information between the state and the uh, latent variable, which essentially encourages us to, us to learn diverse policies, uh, but diver policies that are very predictable based on Z. And then here's the constraint that essentially tries to ensure that those policies are good. Um, and then at test time, we roll out k different policies, each with a different latent variable model, and then return the policy that performs the best with the corresponding latent variable value. OK, um, so we refer to this as structured maximum entropy reinforcement learning. Uh, and we empirically looked at the performance of this algorithm in terms of its robustness to different obstacles, perturbations, and motor failures. Um, we compared this to standard RL, such as SAC, um, an approach that just learns diverse policies, but not in a task-directed way, called diversity is all you need. Um, and then also an approach called robust adversarial RL that is a bit more like a pessimistic approach, it essentially tries to optimize for um, different worst case perturbations. Um, and then in each of these cases, we'll be measuring five-shot generalization. Cool, and then if we plot performance as a function of the amount that the environment changes. Uh, what we find is first, as you change the environment more and more, all of the approaches tend to do worse and worse. Uh, however, in aggregate, um, of course, we find that uh, methods like standard RL or SAC tend to drop off the earliest in these environments. Um, and then we also find that uh, this kind of more structured approach is able to, uh, in most environments, outperform the prior approaches, including an approach that is pessimistic uh, and doesn't have any explicit mechanism to adapt. Uh, and then we can also kind of qualitatively look at what this does. Uh, if you take a policy train with standard RL and introduce an obstacle at test time, it struggles to get to the goal position. Um, whereas with this approach, uh, SMARL learns essentially multiple different policies that uh, have different gates, some of which kind of hop in different ways and one of which also kind of flips on its back. Uh, and this last policy is actually the one that performs the best at test time because it's able to essentially flip over the obstacle. Okay, um, so to summarize this, this part, uh, really uh, the, the main takeaway, at least for me, is that a small amount of data at test time can provide a large amount of leverage for trying to tackle this form of distribution shift. Okay, and then lastly, I wanna talk about anticipation and specifically settings where the distribution shift is changing over time. Uh, and in particular, we're again going to be looking at a reinforcement learning setting where the distribution is gonna be continuously changing in a smooth manner over time. And uh, whenever you're thinking about a new problem setting, it's worth thinking about prior work on different problem settings. Um, one prior work in this direction is the framework of POMDPs, uh, which does cover this form of setting, but it's perhaps a bit too general and that it's difficult to provide algorithms that do well in this, this very general setting. Uh, there's also problem settings such as Bayes adaptive MDPs and hidden parameter MDPs uh, that have hidden parameters underlying the transitions and their rewards. However, they assume that the hidden parameters are stationary and so that they assume that there isn't any distribution shift about how these transitions and rewards are changing. Um, and so with this in mind, we wanted to introduce a 
new problem setting that can actually handle this form of continuous distribution shift, uh, where there are hidden parameters underlying the transitions and the rewards that are uh, fixed within an episode, but these parameters can systematically shift across episodes. So we'll have kind of, uh, yeah, continuous non-stationarity across, um, across different episodes. Okay, so then the next question to ask is, well, okay, say we have these, this continuous shifting environment, how well do existing algorithms perform with such shifts? Um, so we took, started with two very simple settings where we had a, a robot with a shifting goal and this, uh, this half cheetah with varying wind and varying uh, target velocities. And what we find is that if you take uh, existing algorithms such as SAC and PPO, as well as a method like Slack that is somewhat defined to solve POMDPs, uh, these methods actually tend to perform quite poorly on these environments, despite the fact that they're pretty simple forms of distribution shift. Uh, in contrast, an oracle that has access to how the distribution is changing uh, does significantly better. Okay, so to try to actually build an algorithm that can solve this kind of problem, we built upon the idea of reinforcement learning as probabilistic inference, which formulates a graphical model underlying reinforcement learning, and then introduced a latent parameter Z um, inside this graphical model that shifts over time. Uh, and one of the key assumptions that we're gonna make here is that we can actually, we have some ability to predict forward what the future distribution will look like. Uh, we have, there's essentially some kind of arrow from Z to Z prime that allows us to, uh, yeah, predict forward the distribution shift. And under this graphical model, we can formulate a, uh, a lower bound on the likelihood uh, to get an objective uh, for kind of optimizing for optimality in this graphical model. Uh, this equation might look like a lot, uh, but we can break it down. This first term is essentially trying to model the dynamics and the reward as a function of your state and action, as well as your estimate for the latent variable. The second term is essentially trying to model how the latent variable is shifting over time, learning this predictive model over that latent variable. And then this last term simply corresponds to entropy regularized reinforcement learning, where your policy is conditioned on your latent variable Z. And this is important so that it's actually taking into account what part of the distribution that is in. Okay, um, so we'll refer to this approach as uh, lifelong latent actor critic. We can instantiate it in a deep reinforcement learning framework. Uh, and on the two simple settings that I mentioned before, we see that we get a significant uh, improvement over algorithms that don't take into account this distribution shift um, by nature of being able to predict forward uh, the latent variable and adapt to it. Uh, and then on more challenging settings, such as this Minotaur robot with a continuously varying payload, and also this uh, 2D environment with kind of a continuously varying wind and also no resets throughout the course of the learning process, we also see that we're able to, to achieve significant improvements over methods that aren't, uh, don't try to tackle this form of distribution shift. Okay, so the takeaway here is that by modeling and anticipating how the distribution shift will change, we can effectively learn amidst this non-stationarity. Um, and then one last thing that I would like to mention here is uh, we can actually extend this formulation to distribution shift that isn't just evident in the environment, but also distribution shift that's caused by other agents in the environment. And so now the key conceptual change here is that the agent's action can now influence the latent variable Z and how it changes at the next time step. Um, and where Z can capture, for example, the aspects of the environment, but also can capture the agent strategy. Okay, and then to do this, um, we're gonna predict the future Z not only from the past Z, but also from the entire past trajectory. Uh, so we can get a kind of a form of autoencoder that looks like this, where we, um, from the previous trajectory, we predict forward uh, ZK, the, the Z at the next time step, and then also try to reconstruct the, uh, that trajectory from the latent variable. Um, and, and this kind of representation learning aspect where we're trying to learn a, a representation of the other agents 
intentions or that other agent strategy um, will be combined with a reinforcement learning uh, component that conditions the policy on that latent variable. And then once we learn this policy, we will, between interactions, predict the strategy of the other agent and condition our policy on that strategy in order to take actions. Uh, and this will kind of repeat over the interactions with, between the two agents. Um, and if we maximize rewards within these different interactions, we can anticipate change and, and react to that change. However, one last thing that we do, we can do is because the actions can actually affect how the distribution changes or how the other agent changes, is if we maximize rewards across interactions, we can actually also start to influence how the distribution changes uh, and influence how the other agent acts in order to maximize rewards. Okay, so we applied this, uh, this framework to a setting where there are two agents. Uh, the first agent is the one that we control on the left and the other agent is trying to, essentially trying to kind of shoot uh, this air hockey puck towards our agent. And um, we're of course trying to block it. And if you take uh, an algorithm like SAC, it isn't really designed to handle this form of distribution shift. And it, um, it isn't able to kind of handle the non-stationarity of the other, other agent uh, shooting in different spots. And specifically, the, uh, in this case, the other agent strategy is determined based on where our agent blocked at the previous round. Uh, and in contrast, if we use the framework that I mentioned before, after about two hours of training, uh, the video doesn't want to play. Let's try this again. Yeah. Whoops. Cool. After about two hours of training, um, it can block uh, somewhat consistently uh, and can essentially anticipate where the agent is going to shoot at the previous time step. And then after four hours of training, it's much more consistent in blocking correctly. Uh, and in this case, we also rewarded it more to block on this side. And we see that it actually influences um, kind of where it's blocking at one time step influences where the other agent is going to shoot to encourage it to shoot more on this side. Um, and so quantitatively, uh, we can look at the success rate and see that we first achieve much higher success rate by uh, anticipating for this form of distribution shift. Uh, and also if we look at uh, the no influence setting where we're only optimizing for rewards within interactions, it doesn't actually influence where the other agent is shooting. Whereas if we optimize reward across interactions, it could actually influence more influence and influence the other agent to kind of strike more on the left side than on the right side. Okay, um, so to conclude this part, um, uh, in addition to just adapting to distribution shift, we can get ahead of the shift in environments that are changing in predictable ways. Uh, and in some cases, we can actually influence the shift uh, and use that to our advantage to, um, to become more performant. Um, so to summarize overall, uh, I talked about three tools for tackling distribution shift, uh, pessimism, adaptation, and, and anticipation. Uh, and yeah, I think that these are really useful and, and practical tools for trying to actually get a handle of these really challenging distribution shift problems. Uh, I'd like to thank my students. And if you're working on distribution shift, I'd really encourage you to check out the Wilds benchmark uh, and I'd be happy to answer some questions. Great, thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk. Uh, so I think we have enough uh, time for questions. So if anyone has a question, just please uh, turn on your audio and ask. So I guess one question from kind of middle of the talk uh, was uh, in the chat was, how old is different from extreme value theorem? Can you elaborate more on that question? Okay, if, I don't know if Itamar is still on or not. But. Well, I think you're coming with a lot of new concepts and techniques, of course, but uh, the EVT is there for a long time, 
And there is also, it reminded me, out of sample and in sample. And maybe you can comment or you elaborate more about what do you mean by OOD? Yeah, I guess um, when I say OOD, I, I guess tr using a, a maybe too general term of something that's kind of out of sample or uh, just, uh, yeah, data points that are different from the, the training distribution. Um, yeah, and I don't know if, if you're specifically talking about the reinforcement learning part or a different part. No, I'm looking for the, the so-called long time statistical methods to view outliers out of distribution, out of expectation. Uh, you know, this RL is quite modern and very new. And it's nice because uh, it looks like implementation is uh, readily there, but uh, I don't think it is erasing the, the previous methods. Yeah, I guess um, for this slide in particular, I'm not sure if this is what you're referring to, but um, I guess the, um, while I, I guess the, what I mentioned in each of these blue boxes is probably a dramatic simplification of, of the actual algorithms, like how you actually go about minimizing these isn't a matter of, it isn't just a matter of like detecting what these states and actions are and then um, and then minimizing it. It's, I guess there's a, a fair amount of um, more detail behind the methods uh, that I unfortunately didn't have time to get into. Um, that said, I, yeah, I agree that a lot of the concepts in, um, in there's a lot of concepts in statistics and so forth that um, are quite relevant to machine learning. Okay, thanks. Hi, Chelsea, I'll have a question for you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so thanks for the great talk and uh, also appreciated the, uh, uh, given that the talk was supposed to be in Toronto, I liked the uh, hockey reference. That was the hockey data. That was great. Um, so my question was about the context example that you gave or the context method where you were using some unlabeled data to infer context. And then, yeah. uh, so was the assumption, I didn't quite catch the assumption there. It's the assumption that the, um, what is, so you said that groups are known in some way. So what does that, what does that mean exactly in this, in this, like the federated writing? So you assume that you know you have a new person that, that's handwriting, that's the examples that you have. Is that the, is that the kind of definition of groups here? And then the other question is, what does context mean here? Does this mean that, you know, you're trying to recognize that person's handwriting? Presumably it's from some combination of previous things that you've seen, or can you also extrapolate to very new handwriting? Yeah, so the, um, in this case, yeah, exactly. Groups are different users. Uh, and so the assumption is that you, in your training data set, you know which parts of your data come from which one user versus another user. And you can essentially separate that out such that you adapt to uh, a user, uh, it's essentially the notion of task in a meta-learning setting. Uh, and that at test time, you also know that, like you, you have at test time, for example, you have data only from a single user. Um, or from a few users, but they're kind of separated out uh, into those users. Uh, yeah. And then with regard to your second question about context, um, the context is essentially something that is computed from the unlabeled examples from the test user. Right, and I guess but my question there was more about how does that, you know, test user relate to previous users, right? So is the, is the current context, I think of it as some combination of previous contexts or can it actually adapt the very new context? Yeah, so I think that um, you can't really expect to do well on out of distribution users. I think that you, essentially this allows you to do well at distribution shift by nature of having kind of bringing things up a level to the meta level such that you have multiple distributions during training time and you wanna be able to adapt to one of those. Um, however, if you if you have an out of distribution user, I think that um, this sort of approach would still struggle. And potentially, if you combine it with some of the ideas with pessimism, you might be able to do better. Uh, and that could be an, an interesting direction to explore. But um, yeah, I think that uh, that's still an open problem. <laughs> 
Yeah, thanks. So there are. Hey, oh, sorry, Amir Misu, go ahead. Sorry, so there is a question in chat, and then maybe after that uh, you can ask the question. So, uh, yeah, yes, uh, uh, so hi Chelsea, I was wondering if the adaptation framework has been applied in a supervised setting, and could the different RL policies in the method you mentioned be replaced with different classifiers in that setting? Yeah, so I assume that you're talking about this work. Um, I think that in principle, you could replace these different RL policies with different classifiers. Um, I think that the one of the trickiest part it, for how to do that exactly would be, you need some distance metric to determine whether or not those classifiers are different from one another. Um, the distance metric is a little bit more natural in the RL setting because you can compare the trajectories that arise from those policies. Uh, and that seems to work well, at least for the continuous control settings that we looked at here. Um, Whereas that might be a bit more difficult for a classifier because especially because there's many different classifiers that represent the same exact thing for different weights. Uh, but in principle, I think that if you did have a good distance metric between classifiers, then you could essentially learn multiple different classifiers and then uh, pick the classifier at test time that seems to, to work the best. And ideally those classifiers would pay attention to different, uh, different forms of features. Um, and this isn't this is something that we're actually exploring to some degree, but we uh, don't have any kind of uh, results ready quite yet. So Taylor, if you can. Ask. Yeah, thanks. Um, so Chelsea, I'm really excited that you guys are starting to look at some analogs with hip MDPs and your meta learning work. I felt that for a long time that there's a lot of overlaps there that have gone unexplored. Um, I am, however, surprised that you haven't mentioned some of the updates that have come out since Finale and George's original paper. Um, so primarily Christian Perez's generalization of the HIP-MDP framework that built on some of my prior work. But I, I think that the way that uh, Christian specifically uh, extrapolated two variations in reward and the dynamic structure is very similar to what you explained. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I think that we cited that in, in this paper. Um, and yeah, so ab absolutely. Uh, and I think that there's still a difference between kind of the more generalized uh, MVP and something that where you have like kind of a non-stationary distribution over these dynamics and rewards. Uh, I think that the generalized formulation is still assuming a stationary it, it does. And, and so, I mean, you're correct there. And I, I, I was curious. Um, and so I looked up the archive uh, link and I didn't see the citation there. So that's why I raised the question. I was just okay. curious there. Great. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely add that. Uh, and I'll, I don't know if I'll have space on the slides to add it, but I, I can try. For sure. For sure. Yeah, thanks. I think Hassan was asking and then Mohammed and Lonjo. So I don't know if Hassan is still around. Yes, I'm there. Perfect. Uh, okay, just a follow-up question to what uh, I think the other Hassan asked. Uh, do we, uh, uh, how many different policies uh, do you uh, learn in order for the adaptation to new? And do you think that the number of possible policies can be quite uh, large or exponential and what is your thoughts about how to handle that both in the uh, RL and classification scenarios? Yeah, so in this case we are using five policies uh, in, in all of our experiments. Uh, I think that there's of course a trade-off between the number of policies and the amount you have to, the amount of data you need to adapt at test time because if you have like 10 policies then, then you I want to execute 10 trajectories at test time. Um, ideally, I think that it, it would make the most sense actually to have a continuous space over these rather than a discrete space. Uh, although actually getting that to work in practice is turns out to be pretty difficult. Um, and then we've actually, I mean, we've thought about this a little bit from the theory standpoint. Uh, I think that basically the number of, of things that you want probably depends on the, um, Probably it depends a lot on the problem, I think, uh, and how many different, like, really distinct solutions there are, uh, and also how good your distance metric is. Like, if you have a, a distance metric that isn't well aligned with our more intuitive notion of, of diversity, then you may need 
more policies or, or more uh, classifiers by nature of um, of trying to better cover the space of, um, of of possibilities and of solutions. Thank you. So I think Mohammed, if you ask a question. Yeah, thank you first uh, for the amazing talk. Uh, my question uh, is, is regarding uh, the work on multi-agent interaction. Mm -hmm. And uh, like that's, that's quite fascinating to me, but I wonder like how complex the other agents is assumed to be. Like uh, what would happen if you uh, have two of these agents against each other? So each is trying to influence uh, the, uh, uh, the change and like, uh, is it something that you looked at? Uh, I understand that might not necessarily be the case in robotics, but uh, for example, for uh, other applications, uh, it's it's possible that these all of these agents are like uh, so smart, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this could also be the case in robotics as well. Um, we in this context of this specific work, we didn't uh, look into that because we didn't didn't quite have time. And there are. I guess I will say there are examples beyond this this air hockey example um, in in the paper, including like a driving setting and uh, and some other simpler settings. Uh, I think that if I were to guess at how well something like this would work if the other agent is learning, is I think it would be probably a lot more difficult uh, to to predict what they're going to do next and how they're going to learn because you essentially need to understand their learning process to some degree. Uh, there is, I mean, of course, really uh, awesome work in this area by including like folks uh, soon to be at Toronto, uh, like, like Jacob Forster. Um, yeah, I, I think that like in principle, those kinds of learning updates should be somewhat predictable. Uh, and, and in which case these approaches might be able to tackle them, but it's also just a really hard problem. And uh, yeah, and, and something that uh, I'd love to see more work on. I see, thank you. So I think, Longin, if you ask your question, please. Yeah, uh, hi, Professor Fen. Uh, thanks so much for the talk. So my question are about, you know, your papers on lifelong non-stationarity uh, in DPRL, as long as the influencing multi-agent interaction paper. So I noticed that in those perspective, in those methods, you need to essentially reconstruct the next state as long as the reward. Um, but sometimes I feel that, you know, in high dimensional control, uh, sometimes if you need to, or let's say images, uh, if you have to reconstruct the entire thing, the entire next state, sometimes that's a little difficult to optimize. And I think uh, methods like Perl, you know, successfully avoided reconstructing the next state by uh, optimizing simpler objectives. So I wonder if you have any thoughts on, you know, can we uh, do something similar, uh, but without really reconstructing the next state? or rewards? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think that uh, like in general, if you want to have some notion of predictability, it's a bit difficult to move beyond something that is generating something about the future. Uh, it, you don't necessarily have to generate the state. You could, you could imagine, for example, an approach that generates some encoding of the next state, some representation of that next state. Uh, and that, that may be easier to deal with, although then there's the question of where do you get that representation, of course. Uh, I mean, the other, I think, approach that, uh, that you can use for prediction that avoids generation, of course, is things like dynamic programming um, and Q-learning, although even, even in those cases, you need to um, have something that you are accumulating over uh, to, to, to predict the Q value, for example. Um, there is one interesting paper uh, I know that Martha White was a co-author on it that was uh, handling this sort of non-stationarity in a completely model-free way. Uh, it was taking more of a pessimistic approach rather than something that tries to anticipate distribution shift. So in settings where you can predict forward, it may do a bit worse, um, but it also of course avoids this issue of needing to generate things. Um, I, can't re I can't remember the exact name of the paper, but if you look up like Martha White non-stationary or something, you might be able to find it. Uh, and, and that is kind of, I think, one reasonable approach. All right, thank you. Yeah, and I think also if, you, if you're trying to look for that, we also cite it in this paper as well. So I think Javier, if you ask your question. 
Hi, hello. Um, thanks for the talk. I, I missed it the other day at, at UCL. Um, so my question is regarding the uh, diversity is all you need paper. Uh, it seems the, um, that conditioning your policy on a latent skill representation um, yields uh, very surprising results and it learns uh, some low level locomotion skills independently without the notion of reward. Um, and my question is, um, why, why stop there, right? How, how representative or how complex can these skills get if you train on uh, more or on, on environments that might uh, enable more involved uh, behaviors? Um, I guess first I'll say I'm, I'm not actually an author on, on that paper, uh, although we did build on it in, in this paper. Uh, that said, I'm of course quite familiar with the, the approach in the paper. Um, I certainly think it'd be interesting to explore this direction in more complex environments and, and hopefully try to learn uh, more complex behaviors as a result. I think that oftentimes the behavior that you get out of an environment is often a function of the complexity of that environment. Uh, and yeah, I think that there. Are, I, mean, I think that, that a lot of the challenges more lie in in optimization challenges with these kinds of approaches. Um, part of which is just stemming from basic RL algorithms uh, being tricky to optimize, and part of which stems from uh, the difficulty of these kinds of two-player games. Almost um, there are more recent approaches, such as the Dad's paper by Archit Sharma, uh, that actually, in in a follow-up paper by him, actually also showed these kinds of skill discoveries on a real quadruped robot. Uh, so I think that it's been exciting to see some of those advances. Um, and I think that uh, that algorithm is also more stable than the Diane paper, uh, but I think there's also a lot of work left to be done there.